Welcome everyone to the 35th annual Small Farm Conference. Uh, glad to see a lot of people are tuning in. Hello, happy afternoon on a Sunday. I thought it was a Monday, but it's not. <laughs> My name is Beatriz and I work with the Community Alliance of Family Farmers. And I just want to thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, and I want to thank our panelists for, you know, dedicating their time to this space and creating the space for us, as well as our sponsors for making this conference happen. Um, if you are tuning into uh, Farming Through Wildfire Season, you're in the correct workshop. But if you're not, um, we want you here and please stay with us. It's going to be really fun. Um, and I just have a few reminders for everyone tuning in that uh, we have a chat and a Q&A. Uh, the chat, use it to introduce yourself, maybe tell us where you're coming from, where you're at, how's the weather out there, and the Q&A would be uh, for any questions you have for our panelists as they go through their presentation. This is just more helpful for our panelists to keep track of your um, questions, in, and they can answer them in a timely manner afterwards. As a reminder, this workshop is being recorded. And uh, one last reminder, please keep the chat friendly, um, no soliciting. Uh, we do not allow that at our workshops. And yeah, just be kind to one another. And with that being said, uh, take it away. All right, thank you, Leah. And thanks to Kat for hosting such an awesome conference today. We're so stoked to be part of this. Uh, let me share my screen and I think Amber will kick us off. Let me make sure this is all up for me. All right, all good. So we just asked for a little housekeeping that Amber and I are gonna tag team. If you can change your name in Zoom so that we can see um, who you are, there's instructions right here. So we'll give you a second to do that. All right, I'm gonna, Amber, do you wanna say anything about Q&A or Bea kind of covered it? Yeah, and I know folks are starting to trickle in too, so it doesn't hurt. Um, and we'll put these reminders in the chat as well. But there is a separate Q&A function. So if you have questions for the panelists um, or our moderators, put those in the Q&A, including any tech issues you're having. And the chat is primarily for sharing resources with each other as attendees, but we'll also try to monitor that in case questions get in there. But sometimes they get lost because the chat gets really busy. And Amber and Dom, just so you know, while I'm sharing, I can't actually see the chat or any questions. So just give me a heads up. <laughs> All right, as you guys said, um, yeah, you can say hi to Dom. Hey, I'm Dom. Uh, I'm the Grizzly Corps Fellow working with Amber on the Wildfire Resilience Program at Cali. Awesome. So welcome to Farming Through Wildfire Season. This is meant to be a practical conversation. So we are actually would like you all to be very involved in this. Um, before I get started, just wanna say thank Amber and Dom who are from CAF for being here. Amber will introduce herself in a second and we're grateful to have Dom here too. I'm Katie Brim. Um, I'm calling from Farmer Campus. I'm in Colorado right now, but I lived in Northern California for a very long time where I was farming as well as working in advocacy. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I've, um, this is my second year with um, the Small Farms Conference. I'm also on the steering committee. It's so awesome. And again, I just wanna thank everyone at CAF for making this conference happen. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Farmer Campus, which I'll talk about in a second. And really quickly, my background is in agroecology and food sovereignty, kind of the political ecology of food and farming worldwide. But I've also worked very much on a local, um, level. I've been a no-till farmer. I've run a flower farm. Um, I also freelance write about all of these topics and I'm an educator. Um, and yeah, I do all things sustainable ag, agroecology, writing, storytelling, all of those things. So today's purpose, um, why we're bringing you all together here is that we have found that it's hard to find really productive, um, safe spaces to talk about wildfire and farming. It's very traumatic uh, topic. It's also very relevant. I know a lot of people have just been impacted by flooding and there's even snow happening. So fire might be really far from your head, but wildfire is very much connected to when we have big things like flooding, we're going to have a huge fuel load, which is what we've seen over the last six years. So um, I'm so glad that you all are here because this is the time to really be thinking about it and grounding in. But we also just wanted to have a space in which you felt empowered to think through the nuance of this topic, as well as the practical, how do I get prepared? What do I think about? How do I become resilient? What tools do I have? How do I really see myself as a key component to wild, 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 
fire resilience on a state level, which is what we're really excited to think about um, with agriculture. So again, another thing for you all who've joined, we really see ourselves as um, we are experts in this topic, but we really are going to acknowledge that there's probably a lot of people who know a lot about this on this call right now, and we believe in horizontal learning. So there's a PowerPoint, but please use the chat and the Q&A, share your resources, share your thoughts, tell us your story. Um, we really want to hear from you. So don't let the PowerPoint be a barrier. Um, and if you can just like shake your body and maybe take a big deep breath, because if you've already been in this conference all day, you're probably feeling a little tired and we're getting into this presentation. Um, great. So I just, I always start with this quote because I think, as I said, that fire can be such a traumatic force, but really when managed correctly, uh, wildfire is actually a regenerative, really beautiful healing force. And so I just want to plant that in everyone's heads that, that, um, as we start to really confront what has caused wildfire in the way that it's showing up today, that we can turn it into really an ally as we move forward. So a little bit about what we're going to cover. We're just doing the welcoming. We're going we're gonna to share a little bit more about us and what our work is, where then we really want to hear from you all. We want you to connect and share your stories, um, see what the experience is in the room. And then we're going to do a little context setting, setting of why we focus on wildfire and agriculture. Um, and then we will um, have some breakout rooms for you to share with each other. And then we're going to get, I, I sent this link out um, ahead of time, but we'll send it out again. We have an amazing workbook we've developed over the last six years to actually, that's free and we'll give you and it's activities for you to do on farm. So it's extremely practical, um, but it can be overwhelming if you don't have some training. So we're going to do some training on that. For those of you who are farmers, those are things you can implement right away. For those of you that are service prof providers, um, these are things that you can be using in your own work as you work with farmers and ranchers. And then we'll close. So, uh, so how do we think about wildfire? So Farmer Campus, um, we are an online learning platform for farmers and ranchers. We really try to focus on the unprecedented barriers of farmers um, that farmers are facing in this time. So that can be climate or economic um, seeds. There's all sorts of pressures that have um, no one's had to really face before. So we provide um, multimedia education as well as storytelling, disaster response, research. We have this three-tiered response. Um, we've even kind of gone out and gotten our hands dirty and done tailgate trainings and passed out um, uh, PPE during wildfires. So we do a lot of different things. Um, but we then have found that after working in climate for quite a few years, that it was one thing to be educating farmers and working with farmers about thinking through long-term climate change and long-term climate resilience, where you're thinking about carbon sequestration or uh, the way that you grow your crops like no-till, um, so that you are more resilient to climate shocks. What we saw in the last six years though, um, the first year of the big wildfires in Northern California is that farmers couldn't be thinking about soil management if they were having their power shut off all the time and being evacuated, or there was such toxic smoke, they couldn't breathe the air, or they were actually losing their farms to wildfire. And we really saw that there wasn't many people in the space creating targeted education that would help farmers face this. Um, a lot of aid, um, as I'll go into, was falling, letting small farmers fall through the cracks. So we pivoted, and I never thought I'd work in wildfire, but it's really a place where we've seen farmers really need support, but also are really key components of, of all community resilience in general. And we really see farmers as the stewards of land and watersheds and soil. And so if farmers can't, can't survive what is now the new normal of wildfires, we can't even be thinking about long-term climate resilience. Um, and farmers are under dire threat. So um, we'll do a, a pulse check in a second to see how many of you are farmers. But of those you are not, what we've really seen is that farmers, um, they really are not going to be able to make it through unless we have um, really great support to show the way forward and um, have the right tools to do so. Um, so we're drawing on our background with climate resilience and then social movements to really provide that. So the main place that we do outside of research and disaster response is we focus on at Farmer Campus through on education. So we have an online wildfire course. This has got, um, I think, nine or 10 modules at this point. We've worked with extension agents. We worked with university, farmers, ranchers, nonprofits to put together 
um, this amazing course that goes through the whole way you can think about being resilient on your farm. And that's a free online course that we offer. We've gathered case studies through um, podcasts and videos of farmers who've been impacted by wildfire and actually recovered because we found that, that farmers really learn best from each other and they have really specific advice for each other and it can be the best way for, for other peers to really adapt. Uh, we have an online social learning platform um, and network so that farmers can actually share what they've done, um, how they've recovered, where they went when they evacuated, that type of thing. We have this workbook that that's going to be the majority of the second half of this, this training. Um, we were leading regional town halls with CAF where we're actually going in person and sharing materials and showing what each community and who the people are to, to turn to during disaster and beforehand. And then with CAF, we've also um, created a resource clearing house where we just are constantly looking for the best resources out there from financial preparedness to soil health to um, actually putting together a go bag and, and really making sure that that is um, that that's relevant and useful for you. And we've had an incredible impact. We're, we're I think up to a hundred farmers that we've, we've had through come through our course and we've trained. But the way that we do all of that really well is we partner with incredible other organizations that have a bigger reach than we can even have. So we do that with Nuestra Comunidad who's helped us really, um, all of our materials are um, getting translated into Spanish. And we've also partnered with CAF to do some incredible work with them who and I'm gonna bring on now. Ooh, I love it. We're so excited to be working with Farmer Campus and be a part of this movement because that's what it really feels like. My name is Amber Schott. I'm the Wildfire Resilience Specialist with CAF. And um, as Katie mentioned, um, one of the things that brings us to this space is because farmers demanded it. We have an annual um, policy survey that is conducted by our policy team for all our members and constituents. And they spoke up and 2019 and said, hey, we need you to lean into this space. And so CAF found some money and then they found me and then I found Dom. And so through that whole process and including my own training on Farmer Campus's modules, we've built our Wildfire Resilience Advisory Council and all kinds of other resources like Katie mentioned that are really specifically tailored. And they kind of fall into these three different areas of preparedness, response and recovery. So the bulk of the work is in that preparedness bucket trying to help folks understand like what can you do before fire comes to your, your space so that you can really protect yourself but also increase your chances of recovery. Um, but also in terms of response, there's things like accessing the ag or livestock pass programs that might be in your county and understanding different evacuation needs. But also in recovery, we run emergency funding and also try to help support different research out there about different ways that we can farm that will also help recovery. Um, and then I just wanted to mention briefly as well, since I know we're slightly behind time, but that um, CAF's mission, mission statement, if you're not aware of it, is to build sustainable food and farming systems through policy advocacy, on the ground programs that create more resilient family farms, communities, and ecosystems. So that's exactly why this exists and why we're doing it this way. Awesome. So now um, if Dom, you can go ahead and drop the poll in or start the poll. We just wanted to get a better idea of who's in the room and I'm realizing that, oh, I can see it. I can't, I was gonna have everybody raise their hands, but as panelists, we can't actually see all of you. So hi to everyone. Um, we can't see or hear you. <laughs> so if you can fill out the poll, that'll help us get an idea of who you are. So we're gonna give you about it. This is What'd great. You You're like the wizard behind the curtain. We can see the ratios like jumping around as <laughs> yeah. folks are okay. responding, which is really cool to see that um, we've got a nice spread across different ranges here. Yeah, this is all right. Great. All right, we're at hundred percent answered. Um, so it looks like we do have we have thirty two percent farmers and ranchers, which is great. Um, so we've got majority farmers and ranchers in here. We then have fourteen percent technical service providers. We love having you too because uh, we really want these materials to get out into the world, into your work. Professionals serving ag. Um, we know that everyone kind of comes into ag in different ways. Um, so I, I'm curious about um, all the things that you do. And then we've got 36% other, which I would love to know the breakdown, but um, we'll have to do that another time. All right, we can do the second poll now. If you guys want to share the results too, we can do that too. All right, so this one, um, so I'm 
Oops, I can't actually change my slides during this. Um, okay, well, the next poll is about your experience with wildfire. And so as you'll see, I, don't, I think everyone can see what's happening on here. Um, with the multiple choices, we understand that you may have multiple of these that have you've been impacted. Uh, maybe it's happened to someone you know, but it's also happened to you. Maybe you've been impacted by smoke, but you've also um, are feeling really concerned. Uh, mainly to show that wildfire really, it's this huge force. So I think a lot of people, um, especially now that I've moved away from California and you think about wildfires, uh, it's easy for people to think it's just when it hits your land and burns down your infrastructure that that's your impact from wildfire. But really it's, it's, it has a huge impact whether it's hit you or not, especially on farmers. Um, when I was farming in Northern California, we never actually had our, our farm burn but we lost crops due to just not having enough UV rays coming through the smoke to defrost. Once we had big temperature swings, um, we'd have to send our, our farm workers home early and not be able to harvest because the smoke was so toxic. Um, we had our CSA members lose their houses or have to be evacuated. So we no longer had markets to sell at and lost crops that way. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that, that farmers are vulnerable during these times. And there's what we're pushing for also is to have the appropriate aid for people um, going through wildfires because it's not just when you lose a building. Um, so let's see, we've got 50% have been impacted in, indirectly. Let's see, we have 41% it's had on or occurred on your land or near your land, which is huge. So I just wanna say again, this is a traumatic topic. So I welcome you all here and we look forward to hearing more about that experience. Um, I'm also collecting case studies, so if you do have a pretty big story to tell, please reach out to me. Um, and then let's see, 23% have provided services to address wildfires. Thank you for your work. And a lot of people are here because they're concerned or see opportunity to see how to give help, um, which is awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Dom. If you can close that, then um, I can take that over. Got it. Yep. Thank you everyone for engaging with that. It's just useful us to really know who's in the room. And I um, I really appreciate being able to do Zooms, but I always wish that we were in a room so we could hear, you know, engage with you about these um, huge topics. Um, let's see, so just that and other, let's see, I can get, um, okay, so. Why are we focusing on wildfire farming and agriculture? This is a question that um, I sometimes get just to myself of what are we, why are we, why are we doing this? Um, but really we, what we want your, the takeaway from this is to understand the really the power of farmers and ranchers in, um, in implementing resilience. But also um, for those of you who have not been impacted or may not feel that quite yet to also understand how dire this really is. Um, we see that farmers are the stewards, the main stewards of our private land these days. Um, we've had a ma major um, void in, in proper land management, and that's caused a lot of the current fuel load um, production that, we, that wildfires are burning so quickly through now and making them so devastating. Um, so if we really think about agriculture, it's an amazingly key place um, to and potent place for us to move forward in this. And I am going to talk about that in a second. But since it's you know, probably snowing there or raining. I just want to bring us back to the realities of what wildfire is like for farmers and ranchers. So farmers are on the front lines. Most of them cannot make, you know, a month without income. You might be living paycheck to paycheck if you're a small farmer. So having this type of impact where you actually have to lose a week's worth of crops or um, lose everything in your walk-in freezer or having to lose your, um, your farm workers for the week because of the smoke, um, it makes it really, really hard to recover. And what we saw in the first few years of wildfires is they were still treated as a one-time impact, like a, a freak thing that had happened. And there was no support system set up. Um, the aid that was available was for large scale commercial farms um, or things like FEMA were extremely slow to respond. And we found that farmers were really left out of that, especially if you're rural. Um, and so this is a really important place for all of us to be focusing because farmers are um, keeping our food system alive as well as our communities alive. Um, and we see that they're really important in a lot of different scales. So I'm gonna hand this over to Amber. Thanks for that recap, Katie. Yeah, the former photo on the left there was Pie Ranch and I had the distinct pleasure of 
replacing a lot of that melted irrigation and pond liner and those those impacts are real and they're intense and um yeah it always feels like farmers are fighting something drought you know frost wildfires and so what we see is that farmers or ranchers are already operating as general land stewards, like off, often in areas like the WUI, the wildland urban interface, and naturally acting as buffers for higher urban density and critical infrastructure areas. So they're the first set of eyes monitoring changes over time. Um, and the practices that they're implementing also provide larger ecosystem service benefits like healthy soil, you know, water quality. Um, cleaner air, all of those things. And so really supporting farmers and ranchers in that role is really one of the things that we want to do, in, including really uplifting the different uh, methods that are out there like prescribed grazing or um, beneficial burning techniques to help bring the land back to its full capacity to both be resilient to things like wildfire, but also other climate impact, impacts as well. So um, just a quick example of that is that the higher your organic matter, right, the better uh, your soils are able to attenuate heat stress um, during like prolonged wildfire impacts. So that's something to keep in mind. You might already be trying to increase your organic matter for other reasons like fertility, but you'll actually get these like multi benefits. So we're trying to do some of that work behind the scenes to marry those um, crossover areas and provide that information in accessible ways. Another way we've seen is we have ecological benefits of, of farmers to wildfire resilience, but we've also seen that during a disaster, um, already farmers are part of the social fabric of a community, especially in producing um, rural livelihoods. But when we've seen disasters happen, these, these photos are um, from Sonoma County, in which because um, big top the top-down aid that was happening, we had like Amazon gift cards, the Walmart gift cards being given out to refugees. Um, whereas farmers were just donating their produce for free to refugees while also being impacted by fires themselves. And so this was a case study in which we saw um, the Sonoma family meal and calf and a bunch of surrounding farms and um, Sonoma Feed, all, who is a distribu distribution company, all came together to raise money and be able to actually buy uh, produce from farmers that were impacted by wildfires for market price. So they were, farmers were able to sell, have a market immediately and, and immediately get their produce bought. Um, but then that was made into meals and given to refugees and um, frontline workers during that time. So we had this mutual aid network that was set up during that time that was that was doing multi-level things for the social emergency um, disaster relief. And then what we saw was that when things like COVID happened, that that power and those networks that were already in place were, were incredibly efficient in getting out aid um, for that next disaster. And it's something we've seen actually worldwide that we have disasters like this happen. Um, it creates these amazing response networks and then farmers are often looked to as leaders during that time. And we made this slide just for, for those of you who are producers to really understand how many relationships you naturally have as part of your profession. Um, and you're at the center of these. So you have your CSAs, you're connected to food banks, you're con connected to your extension agents, your employees, your family, your friends, neighbors. These relationships, and I've studied this across the world, are really what make resilience. It's beyond all the other things, it's the resilience um, comes from relationships. And so farmers are naturally looked at as leaders because they've already built these naturally. And so when a disaster happens, those are the things that will get you through and you can help your communities uh, bounce back by, by tapping these type of networks and really knowing how to lead, lead your community forward. So now, since we've already talked a little bit, we wanna get you all talking to each other. Um, we're gonna break up into small groups just for let's do about 10 minutes, um, Dom, since we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, and so we really want you to share, this is a discussion group. So introduce yourself for a second, just say um, you know, one word maybe that sums up how you're feeling, what your county is, and if you're a producer, and then um, what are you as farmers, if you're a farmer, what do you have as an asset relative to wildfire? Like, um, is it your relationship with land? So you know um, where, where a fire might come or do you know how to evacuate? Do you have a trailer and you can evacuate livestock? You know, things that might you might not have thought of that make you actually um, prepared in a way that you didn't think of. And if you're an ag professional um, and anyone else that's not a farmer, um, what are you seeing? What are you hearing with your work? What is what you, what is your relationship been to these wildfires? Um, and that's just to get started and you're welcome to go beyond that. Since we're a bigger group, 
um, we're gonna, these are gonna be facilitated by you. So just make sure to give each other space and time to, to talk um, and we'll come back in 10 minutes. So go ahead, um, and Dom. Katie, sorry, but I think Dom doesn't have the host abilities to do breakouts. I think you do. Okay. Sorry. I actually Bear with know. us folks. Um, if you were no. in a classroom, we'd make you number off, but instead we're gonna use I believe you can go to participants and Bea, maybe you can help drive. Yeah, Bea, them. can you do that? Because I don't think I can right now. Yeah. Tom, do you? Because I don't think I have additional permissions. And in yeah, the I'm meantime, folks, seeing. just be thinking about um, maybe if you're comfortable being the person that does a little report back at the end and how you'd want to answer these questions or share in that conversation. And we'll do our best to pop in and out and help grease the wheels in case folks are not. You know what, if we don't have it, let's just do, um, let's just do this live. So can people- Yeah, people, people can, I think they can answer, they can raise your hand and maybe we can unmute them. Okay, sure. Not 90 I, people. So. I don't, yeah, I don't see break, I don't think breakout uh, rooms are available in webinar. I think mm. it's only available uh, through meeting. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay that's okay we'll um, adapt on the fly um yeah does anyone want to share what whether it's in the chat or you know um if you want to throw it in the q a it helps us to understand what folks are really struggling with so for example we've been on a couple different webinars of this um, nature and you know the thing that came up was uh accessing your land during an evacuation or during a disaster right that became a really important um consideration for folks so over the last year and a half, a lot of the Ag Pass um, programs have been popping up and being refined. So that's been really useful. It looks like we got one in the chat um, from CARB. Um, oh yeah, and so even air quality, right? Like as um, prescribed burns are becoming more popular, we've had to look at the air quality component of prescribed burning and beneficial fire. Um, yeah, it looks like Muriel, you're, you're unmuted if you'd like to. Well, I just unmuted you. So, um, the, um, a lot, the, the, um, stress on people, a lot depends on the kind of fire it is. Um, so we are evolved actually for hundreds of thousands of years to live with fire, but the kind of fire that, uh, it appears to me we are evolved to live with is more like, um, you know, indigenous type of fire where it's frequent and it's not hot. So it's your really hot fires that give you the small particulate that our nasal passages are not evolved to screen out. Um, so, you know, um, people talk about the dangers of, of cooking with natural gas and cooking with wood. And I'm always like, well, can we also talk about all the other factors, people's health, nutrition, stress and stuff like that. Um, so I, and I think that, I, I think people are um, coming out against gas stoves for political reasons. And I think they're exaggerating the problem, but that's a whole nother story. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Muriel. I'm gonna, uh, thank you for sharing. I just wanna make sure we have enough time since we've got a lot of people, but um, if other folks wanna share your experience, um, if you've been hit by a fire, what would that was like? What you see as an asset? Um, I think if you just raise your hand or you put in the chat that you want to unmute, I can unmute you. And it looks like Olivia um, commented that she's doing a graduate thesis on human wildlife conflicts with mountain lions following wildfires in San Diego County. Fascinating, just as an aside. Um, and you're looking to identify primary succession of plants following a fire, increased predation on livestock. Fascinating too. Uh, there's a Puma project in Santa Cruz, which is my alma mater. And they noticed that that too, like people um, during COVID were like a lot quieter, right? And so the animals are coming in closer to areas where maybe livestock is gonna be present. You know, that's not as, as remote. And so there are all so, sorts of factors. Um, and uh, there's some great folks at California Nat Native Plant Society doing that primary plant su uh, succession research. Um, if you're interested, please email us. We'll be sharing our contact info, but I can put it in there. Um, I'd love to connect you with them too because they've got some great data. Awesome. Thanks, Olivia. Anybody else? 
we were hoping to get you all talking, but it sounds like our tech is not gonna let us do that. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and feel free to keep sharing resources. Yeah, this was actually a topic of discussion. Muriel, thanks for bringing that up in the chat about sudden oak death, Phytophthora, and even um, acorn production, right? Like those low intensity frequent fires that indigenous folks were using actually helped keep a lot of those uh, oaks um, healthier because it would um, burn up some of the like leaf litter that a lot of pests would live in on, on the forest floor. And so there wouldn't be such big um, outbreaks of damage from pests. So there's a lot of great research coming out right now about how that intentional use of fire can be really um, beneficial. And I think that's why we're trying to use like some of the broader terms like beneficial fire versus like cultural or prescribed fire, because it all depends on the ecological management objectives that you have, you know, whether that's trying to reduce weedy invasive species on your property or what a lot of farmers are doing, right, is trying to uh, reduce, reduce the fuel load in areas where they either have structures or access points, things like that, so that um, you know emergency personnel can get in there. Awesome. Yeah. I think let's maybe just continue on, and um, we can have more time for Q and A towards the end. Oh, Aaron Hardyman, Angelina, do you want to say something? I'm suddenly seeing everybody. <laughs> So I'm, just, right. I'm just gonna mute everyone so you don't feel timid and we're definitely welcoming you to participate and let us know any questions you have. So I'm gonna unmute everybody. Yeah, and if you don't even have anything to say when you get unmuted, go ahead. Can everybody just unmute and say hello for a second? I'm gonna do that. Hello. Hello. Afternoon Hi. all. Hi. Ah, so much better. I don't know if you've, anybody else has been a presenter on these before, but it pretty much makes it so we can't see you at all. It's like the ultimate Zoom isolation. <laughs> and very much not how we want to design this. That's it. All right, well, well it's great to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say hello to everyone. I'm Aaron Hardman from El Dorado County. Uh, clearly a lot of fires up here in El Dorado County and uh, just happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Aaron. Um, also, just wanted to add about biochar and all the wonderful things that biochar can do for us um, on the farm and industrially. Awesome. Thanks, Muriel. You and all? Hi, it's Adrian from up in Hay Fork, Trinity County. Thanks, you guys. Hey, Adrian. Nice to have you here. And one of the intentions, if we were to be able to have a more of a discussion and have each other meet, meet you, meet each other, is really just to form a social network too. For those of you that actually are concerned about wildfire and thinking about this, it's really helpful. We need to be having coalitions. We need to have people think working together across sectors. So that's part of what we want to be doing with this call today. So feel free to keep sharing in the chat about what you do and what you can offer, what you need, resources, what you're noticing. Um, so use that and go ahead and um, share at any time. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we will have more Q&A at the end. So I think let's move forward so we can get into the workbook um, since we can't do breakout rooms, but please, I encourage you to use the chat to talk to each other. Uh, let me go back into here. All right. So the key takeaways were that um, sounds like there's a lot of people out there that are concerned about this and thinking about this. Let's all stay in touch. There's so many ways in which we can build resilience. Okay, so the second half of this is um, that was really a way for you to be thinking about wildfire and kind of thinking of your roles and what's been happening in the history in California. Um, and then at Farmer Campus over the last six years, we've been running this online course, we've been doing research, um, we've been doing in-person meetings, but we really wanted to be able to offer a tool to the, the farming community. So we've put together the Farming Through Wildfire Season Workbook. This is um, gonna be completed at the end of this year and it will include case studies um, from farmers and ranchers that have adapted to wildfire, but it also will have chapters from partner organizations, um, some context setting, kind of more of a narrative feel to it. But what we're sharing today are practical activities we've developed, and these are what we've used in our online course. Um, and this is, you can download it on your computer, but we can also, if you, if you um, email us, we can send you a physical copy as well. And this is for, if you go through all of the activities in this workbook, you will be heads and shoulders above 
most other people in actually building resilience on your farm. And so this is the incredibly practical tool. And for service providers, we want you to be paying special attention for this um, to be using um, in any time when you're giving service to farmers that are thinking about wildfire and if they're not helping them actually start to plan. Um, so Dom, I think, have you were you able to drop that into the chat? Okay, so you can yeah. follow the link that Dom just dropped in and that will allow you to download our e-version of this. Um, and then we will let you know when the, the next version is available. And so this is kind of the way we've been thinking of, of organizing this workbook. And we want to introduce you to some of the risks on farms. So you can see there's kind of three major categories of risk. We have your threat, your vulnerability, and your response capacity. So if you can see under the threat section, you have potential fire magnitude, you have your slope and the landscape type that you might be living or farming on, your adjacency to the WUI, which is your wildfire urban interface, um, history of evacuations of smoke, smoke, expected loss. These, The threat is something that you can't really change that easily. So like your fire magnitude, um, it you may have a massive fire, or you have a, may have a small fire. Um, these are just big threats. But then under vulnerability and response capacity, so vulnerability are things like, are you living up against an old forest? Um, do you have you created defensible space in forests? Do you have relationships in place um, that would be part of your mutual aid network? Um, are there is your infrastructure hardened to wildfires or not? Um, these are what things that are some of the components that makes you vulnerable. Um, it makes you more at risk to um, the threats that are coming at you from wildfire. Um, these are things you can actually impact. And then your response capacity, this is how quickly are you gonna, are you gonna be able to respond when a fire comes? So um, do you have financial safety and security? Are you gonna be able to recover quickly? Um, do you have a backup generator in case your power gets turned off and you wanna be able to um, irrigate your crops? Um, does your workforce know how to respond? They know who to call if they start seeing smoke and how to implement a communications plan. Um, do you have relationships with other agencies um, like the RCD or NGOs or like CAF? Um, if those relationships are in place, those are you know who to call, they're going to be able to either help you prepare or help you recover, even help you respond when a wildfire comes. So if you think about these, these last two categories, this is where um, using the, this workbook, as well as just, um, I think this is kind of overwhelming, but just being able to see it will help you start thinking through ways in which you'll be more efficient when a wildfire comes. Which again, we live in a California, in California, so it is a wildfire ecology. So it's not really a when or an if it's coming, wildfires will be coming. This is part of um, living, in Cal living and farming in California. And I wanted to share the reality of wildfire losses in agriculture. Because again, what I said at the beginning is a lot of times when we think about wildfire, it's something like there's a fire coming, it's coming at you, it's burning your infrastructure, it's your, you've lost your barn, or you're, you may maybe lost a life, which would be incredibly scary. Those are like the really big parts of wildfire. But for farmers, there's really nuanced losses that a lot of aid has not thought about. And a lot of farmers haven't even thought about of the, of the potential of loss on their farm. So this is, um, I took from a case study I did with a farmer in Glen Ellen that lost their farm to a wildfire um, in Sonoma County, in Sonoma, sorry, proper. And so these are some of the things that, that he reported um, post wildfire. They had missed work, they had storage crops, things like carrots, apples, winter squash, that, that was income they were planning to kind of cash in through the winter when they weren't farming. Um, their perennials, they had invested in massive fields of perennials and they were impaired. Um, so they lost about $10,000 just from sales from like, like blackberries, for instance. Um, some come back, but it took about three years for them to recover. Um, their habitat, the wildlife habitat, that's you know going to provide beneficial insects, birds, all of the things that provide the habitat and um, that are part of an organic farm, that was that was lost. Um, they lost their seed supply, so they had to reorder all of their seeds. Um, dam and infrastructure, that's something that people think about, but there's gallons of diesel in there, for instance. Their workshop with all of their, their power tools was lost. Um, their walk-in cooler was plugged in, so when the, it, it fried when the power did come back on, so they lost their cooler. Um, 
their melted fencing. So these are things to really be thinking as, as service providers as well as like all the different things for farmers to really be looking at, which can feel really overwhelming and scary. But if you start planning now, you don't have to have these losses. But it's also to show that farmers really like they're hit really, really hard. Your, their livelihoods are tied to their land. So if they're evacuated, for instance, they can't actually be producing income. Um, so this is why we really focus um, at this nexus. So the wildfire workbook breaks into activities of these four different categories. Um, so hopefully everyone's had a chance to um, download it. And we're not gonna go through all of the activities today. We're gonna just focus on one major one, but we wanted to walk you through some of the components of, the, of this workbook so that you can think about um, how you can focus your time. So as you can say, you can assess and reduce your wildfire risk. Um, so that's actually, you know, creating defensible pace, um, doing this vulnerability assessment, you can increase your response capacity, and then you can plan for recovery. So after a wildfire has happened, um, do you have insurance, financial prep, preparation, um, do you have community in place, and then how to rebuild having socio-ecological resilience. So those are things that are components of the workbook. Um, today, we're going to focus on just a couple of the activities. So this first one, and you'll see this on page seven. This is about creating a farm map. This is like the simplest thing you can do to prepare. This is a great thing to do when it's raining outside and you have nothing better to do. Um, draw out, you can either do it online. There's also, there's um, some resources for how you can do this online. Otherwise just use, use a handwritten drawing. You can put um, where your solar panels are, where there's a pond, where your, where your fuels are. Um, where the access roads are. Those are things that are really good for you and your crew to know, but you can upfront just take this to um, your fire department, even have them out on your farm, give this to them. And then, then a fire comes, they will know where all these things are. They will know where the dangerous fuels are. Um, they will know where the access roads, they'll be able to open gates for you if you weren't able to, to let your animals out. Um, and this can really, really increase your response capacity. This is for you, Amber, are you there? Yeah, thanks. Um, so if you have only a few things that you can address, these are probably the, the most critical ones. Um, looking at the existing risk factors in your area, um, your defensible space. We've worked with Luca Carmignani and Zach Main on our advisory council to address defensible space for farmers and ranchers, which includes infrastructure hardening that maybe like single family residences don't think about. And that includes like you know, if you have a fire coming and you've got like a hoop house area versus like your barn where all your equipment is, like you're probably not going to try to save the poly, right? You're going to focus your efforts in, in areas where you can actually do some good. Um, and then also you really want to address emergency access. Um, so how do you get in and out multiple points of, of entry and also how does emergency um, vehicles, you know, get in there as well if, if that's an option for you in your area. Um, I think we have some more details, right? Katie, do you want to advance? Uh, this is oh. just goes in the plans. This is just kind of how to do a really high level look to look at um, what your risk and vulnerability is. So it's just these really quick themes that you can go through to, to really know, um, you know, what what's your kind of starting point from a bird's eye view. Yeah, and so I'll actually drop in the chat to a link to a webinar that we recorded on this um, defensible space topic for farmers and ranchers as well. Thanks, Amber. Okay, so then again, getting into that last um, little arrow that I showed, how to increase your response capacity. So this means when everyone's paralyzed with fear because there's a fire coming, do you are you able to respond quickly enough to have an impact? And the way we found to do that best is to actually have disaster preparedness plans. And we've broken this up into three different plans, um, communications, evacuations, and shelter in place. So your communications, so this is on page 56, and these are templates you can use. Again, you can download as many as you want, or you can keep copying those templates. You can always email us. Um, it's just to put together, you know, who do you call first? Do you have the numbers that are important? Does your crew have them? Can you post them in a place like your barn um, and show everyone that those, those numbers are there so they know who to call um, as soon as something happens? Because in that chaos, the, the more time that goes on before you can start the chain in motion, the more um, dangerous it gets and the least likely you're, you're going to be able to save um, 
your different parts of your operation. And, you know, bare minimum, this is about getting people off, um, off the land safely and into the right places, but it can also help you um, with evacuation is the next plan. So go ahead, Amber, on that one. Amber, are you there? Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, so again, the lowest hanging fruit uh, options for evacuation are just assessing, you know, what do you need for you, your family, your pets, that sort of thing, get your go bags, have your phone tree like ready to go, notify your neighbors, make sure your access, you know, in and out is um, ready to go, things like that, like go a long way during a really stressful, um, you know, in pro disaster in progress moment. And so, um, any little piece that you can do to help yourself feel prepared when that does happen is awesome. And like having sort of the backups to your backups, right? So like one in each vehicle or like far, even in your farming equipment, things like that. But also just um, making sure you communicate with folks in your area, like, hey, I was able to do, you know, X, Y, Z type of preparation for evacuation. Like, what are you doing? And learning from folks around you, how they like to prepare for your certain region. You may have considerations that other folks don't. So definitely something to think about, just get that conversation started and um, start looking at those minimal ways to help you feel more prepared and get ready. Great, thanks. Thanks, Amber. And yeah, that's something um, like one of our case studies, for instance, with Turkey Tail Farm, they talk about their evacuation plans. They ended up being evacuated for a whole month. Um, and so having a plan where you know where you could go to be away that long, if you have livestock, um, having somewhere that would be far out of your county, um, so enough far away from the wildfire that you could evacuate your livestock where they would be safe and have enough forage. Um, but there's really specific things like th that we share in our case studies, like throwing in your chainsaws and your power tools so that when you can get back onto your farm, you can immediately start rebuilding. Um, having generators that you can bring back. They even talked about, um, they went through their entire walk-in cooler and their shed that had all of their cottage goods. They took all their canned goods and all of the meat out of their freezers. And then when they were evacuated for a month, they actually had income because they could have pop-up sales of their meat. And so instead of losing all of that stuff, they were actually able to have it with them where they were evacuated um, and create and generate those sales off farm since they weren't able to be harvesting their crops at the time. Um, and so this is the thing, this is the place to really think through those things. Contact the person who you, the couple people you think you'd want to evacuate to. Um, and again, how are you going to get your livestock off? I, I still love this little icon I made with the sheep in the back of the truck. Um, how are you getting them off? And do they have enough feed? Do they have go bags um, for it? There's Halter Project is a really great organization that thinks about livestock and disasters. So that's another resource to look into. Um, finally is shelter in place. So this is something we do not encourage. We encourage you to follow all evacuation orders. Um, but we understand there's times when a road might get, or your access might get cut off or a fire might come on too quickly and you might not be able to get out. So what happens if you can't get out? This is in a stay and fight. This is what happens if you can't get out. Um, and this is you choose a room in your house or a neighbor's house that you know is um, more resilient to fire that you could actually tape off the um, vents so that you don't have as much smoke coming into the room. You have food and a go bag to be able to weather it out safely. Um, and again, this is emergency, emergency. This is the backup of the backup. Um, if you really have no place to go, it's important to have that um, those systems in place. Yeah, and I just popped a link into the chat too for a blog post that we wrote on like, you know, there are standard like instructions on how to evacuate, but there's a lot of considerations for farmers and, and rural ag community type folks anyway to think about. So take a look at that post, let us know if we missed something, but hopefully that gives you a little more nuanced information. Awesome. Okay, so now we're getting really into the meat of this workbook. And so the rapid risk assessment allowed you to kind of see what your high level risks are and what your vulnerabilities are. So if you've done that, once you've done that activity and you've got a farm map and communications plan, this is where you can actually, this is like the nitty gritty of um, preparedness and response. And this activity we produced, we've, we've had it for about four years now. So it's been trialed by other farmers and everyone tells us it's extremely overwhelming, but they don't want us to reduce it at all. So um, we've kept it at length, but we've redesigned it. So it's a little bit more easy to access. And the, we want to spend some time on this because we actually think that this is one of the most important um, parts of the workbook. And this, again, 
I just want to say that resilience takes time. Some of these things will take you like communities and neighbors. Relationships might take you a year to five years to really build. And that might be having block parties, um, having potlucks with each other, sending emails to check in on each other. Uh, those things will take time. And, and, and all of these activities on top of running a farm can feel extremely overwhelming. So everybody just take a deep breath. <laughs> let it out. Um, and I encourage you as you look through this, we found that just from people looking at this list, they start to act differently on their farm. They start to, you know, if they have an extra 10 minutes, they'll, they'll do one of these activities. Um, so just know that you can do this over time and you should just break this into little bites. Um, and we have an action plan towards the end of the workbook where you can actually start planning this out over the next year, two years, five years, so that you can build towards resilience. But what we've done is built, broken up all the different places where you might be vulnerable into different categories and then created this list. So you can actually check off. Um, you can take notes in here. If you have it on the ebook, you can put some text on there or you can download this and actually have a checklist and go walk around your farm and think about these things. Um, let's see, I'm gonna pass this over to you now. So this is pages 15 through 44, I believe. So Amber, um, so on the very first page of this, you'll see page 15 um, that we have broken. If you do nothing else, these are kind of like the high level, high priority things to do. So um, what Amber's about to walk you through is basically your, your most important category. So um, if you do nothing else, again, this is, this is where you would focus. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, I just dropped the link to the workbook again for those uh, that may want to download it and kind of follow along in that sense. But as I mentioned earlier, we have an entire webinar just on defensible space for farmers and ranchers. So, you know, this is again, the high level look at things. Um, a lot of data coming out says that in a wind driven fire, you need 18 meters between structures. If you don't want fl direct flame contact, that's not feasible for most folks. So if you look at this image as an example, right? Like it's, it's not possible to do that. So you have to look at some of your other options um, for maintaining your spaces or hardening structures move having spaces where your equipment can move where it's not going to get damaged things like that so kind of just preparing those alternatives and knowing okay the, there's some things that are really expensive so you may not be able to utilize that as a method right away what can you do instead and katie mentioned one that like just blew my mind when i first read it is that ember intrusion is one of the most common ways that structures ignite it's not actually like firebrands landing on things or even the um, you know direct flame contact from vegetation it's actually embers getting sucked up into your vents so even just covering your vents with like some aluminum foil like quick and dirty but uh, could probably save a lot of structures that that was a fascinating um, piece for me so anyway just take a look at some of the resources that we've been putting in the chat but obviously um, the workbook also goes into this in great detail and we utilize uh, researchers and farmers, and we try to bring all of that um, variety of knowledge into these uh, resources so that it's very comprehensive and looks at it from multiple sides. I think we can, yeah, advance, thanks. Um, and then similarly, these emergency response, we touched a little bit on this, like you definitely wanna have a plan, you know, like wh where are you going? Where's a safe place if you do get trapped? You know, do you have a water pond? Can you meet there? And also communicating all that to your farm, uh, you know, farm workers, but also other folks that might be visiting, you know, even if you have like contractors on site that are doing something over a long period of time, share that information with them. Where's the water? Where's the backup power? How do I, you know, switch from the grid to, you know, my generator system safely, things like that. Um, and then also, of course, if you have animals, what are your options? Some of our hooved, you know, ungulate animals can do pretty well, actually. They'll just kind of get right back into the black and their, um, their hooved material actually can protect them. But that's not true for things like livestock guardian dogs, right? So like, if you have to kind of choose who to move, um, you might have to think about, you know, uh, doing that quickly. And so kind of have multiple scenarios, A, B, et cetera. And know who in your neighborhood has the livestock trailers. Um, I'll just mention an uh, interesting one in Monterey was that there's a zoo and the zoo loaned out a lot of their large livestock um, equipment for a fire in their area. And so that was really interesting. Um, just places that you wouldn't necessarily think about because you're a farmer thinking about other farmers, but um, yeah, reach out to people in your neighborhood and ask them what they got because they often say yes. Thanks. 
Yeah, and so we talked a little bit about how fire affects the landscape. Um, and there's probably some beautiful biochar right here in this photo. <laughs> and actually a lot of fire species are fire adapted, right? Or fire followers. And so that can actually be a good thing, but intensity uh, does matter. And where you're at on a slope will also often dictate the intensity of a fire, right? If you're at the top of the slope, vegetation is getting preheated. So all that kind of stuff can affect what your recovery may look like. So it's important to um, know your site really well and take those factors into consideration for direct impacts. But there's also, you know, even if you're just eva evacuated because it's close, but you don't have any direct like burning of structures, you're still going to have to pay for a hotel during that evacuation, maybe if you don't have somewhere else to go. Or as we saw during COVID, you know, it wasn't safe, right, for folks to go, um, even if they had backup spaces. So know if you've got the ability to build that cash flow and the safety net for any kind of evacuation type thing, as well as recovery. We know that some folks, right, like take photos and videos of all your equipment, add, add new stuff to your policies as soon as possible. Um, in terms of the insurance, the Farmer Campus has done a really great job about collecting some you know, experts in the field to give presentations on this kind of information because nobody wants to think or talk about it until it's too late. So definitely get involved and, and check out those modules and those webinar um, recordings because they are top notch. Um, and I'll leave it that slide at that for now. Awesome, thanks, Amber. And that's a note from, um, again, kind of the way we work and the way we create education is we look for gaps that um, farmers are falling through and that no one has produced materials on that are relevant. So um, we just finished um, a grant doing financial preparedness for disaster. And we now have a little mini course on farmer campus that you're welcome to join. It's free and we've collected all of these different things, really finding that um, we did a, a statewide survey of farmers um, around topics they most cared about when it came to wildfire and everyone rated insurance as the lowest. And then we found that all the farmers that we have surveyed who have been impacted by fires have said that insurance is one of the highest priorities for education. So it's something that uh, sucks to learn about sometimes because <laughs> it can feel not relevant or it's um, a, there's a crisis in insurance, I think, for farmers and ranchers because you're getting probably dropped from your insurance if you're in a high risk area. But there are ways to actually financially prepare um, even without insurance, but also to, to make yourself more um, approachable for insurance to actually have that safety net. Um, and so it's definitely something to be thinking about, or at least be talking to agents or talking to other farmers in your region who may have that. Um, awesome. So we wanted to give you a little chance to, um, we know it's an overwhelming document. So maybe just take a minute, we'll set a timer um, and don't leave, just spend one minute just looking through um, and maybe kind of noting, you can even just take notes somewhere and note where you feel like you're vulnerable or where you'd like to focus or maybe something that's kind of sparking like, oh, I could do that right now or I could do that after this call. Um, so we'll come back together in a second. I don't know if Amber, you can say music or anything like that. I didn't get it queued up from the Oh, end. I should have queued that up. I Oh, and I think uh, Katie just put the, um, or sorry, thanks Don. That was the workbook and disaster financial prep, yes. I'm also gonna add the link while we're doing this to all of the different videos that Farmer Campus has in their wildfire um, courses, cause they're awesome. Um, and let me see if I can queue up some tunes. So again, for everyone who's on, just use this time just to look through it because the first kind of band-aid ripping off with this stuff is just to get an idea of what to be thinking about, you know? If is it, do you have a communications plan? Do you have backup generators? Have you made a go bag? Have you refreshed your go bag? Um, you know, maybe just look for something bite-sized that you could work on or just get an idea of what's, what the whole thing is, look through it. Um, and then we wanna hear from you. Right, so that was a minute. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear my Cuban music, but. <laughs> Almost hear it. All right, we'll move on. All right, so hopefully that gave you a chance just to kind of look through. Um, we'd love 
if you, now that you all have permissions to, you can unmute yourself. If you want to just share um, just a thought that came to you from the, from the comprehensive vulnerability assessment, something, anything that came up for you, is there something that surprised you? There's something you have a question on and please don't be shy. Otherwise I'll start calling on you. You can also share in the chat, um, you know, any one thing you think like you're super inspired to do now, like whether that's at least read a blog post about something to get more information and resources or, you know, put together a go bag or, you know, buy one that's already ready to go and add your special snacks to it or, you know, all the little pieces that um, just, yeah, it's, it's actually really useful because even with if it's not wildfire, this is like something that you could use for storm evac or any of the other more relevant things that have just been happening recently. Cactus around shipping containers. I love it. Yeah, landscaping um, is one of kind of the other low hanging fruit. Yeah, a lot of succulents are great because they just will not burn. They've got too much water. Go ahead, Aaron, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, I just thought it was excellent advice about identifying livestock trailers ahead of time. Um, and I it, it thought occurred to me that it also seems like relevant information that the local fire safe councils might wanna have on file uh, just to better assist their community and, and all farmers. Thank you. Oh, Katie, awesome. do you, you have that mutual uh, aid Google Sheet, like so, Farmer Campus developed something that kind of helps get kickstart exactly that. Yeah, that's actually I think actually Cass developed that. We um, I don't have it on hand here, but I do. It is in the financial preparedness um, workshop that we just shared. Um, we have a community inventory tool in which you can share. You know, for everybody in your your little community, they can put in different resources they might have, like like a trailer or a big open pasture where livestock could go. Um, in defensible space, or maybe they have multiple cars, or they have walkie talkies, like all sorts of things to kind of get an idea of, of what um, your community resources are. Thanks, Aaron. Can you, um, Aaron, do you want to call on somebody or is there anybody else that wants to go? I'd love to hear from more people. Um, why, Miriam, are you, are you still in chat? I would love to, to hear your thoughts. Or is that Muriel? Excuse me, yes, Muriel. <laughs> How about Angelina? That's the only other person I can see on here. Oh, we've got a seriously quiet group today. Is there such a thing as virtual caffeine injection? <laughs> Hey guys, I'll speak up. This is Laura Murphy from RCD in Monterey County, and just want to thank you for holding this space. Um, and I'm feeling inspired to try incorporating some elements of the comprehensive vulnerability assessment just in my regular ongoing work with farmers. Um, we haven't had as much opportunity in my particular work here to work with wildfire um, impacts, uh, but of course the recent winter storms have been major in our county and affected a lot of the farmers in my network. And just the idea of resilience and all of the disasters that we face um, being a community and social issue um, and figuring out ways that I can start to address and incorporate that with what I do. Thanks for awesome. the inspiration. Thanks, Laura. And is there any, were there any components of this that surprised you if you haven't talk, thought about it or um, were you kind of already thinking through the, all these categories? Um, I haven't really been thinking about it in terms of how I do day-to-day -day technical assistance for irrigation management or nutrient management, but I think there are ways that I can. Awesome. Thanks so much, Laura. Anybody else? Oh, Aaron, did you have another question or we just didn't put your hand down? Sorry. Yeah, excuse me, just haven't lowered my hand. <laughs> okay, no worries. And it looks like really interesting. Anne um, put in the chat that she's excited to share data from a weather station with local fire officials to get a conversation started. And that made me think that there's like amazing apps out there 
Um, smoke spotter is one of them. Um, watch duty is another. So smoke spotter is like, so you can see uh, different prescribed burns that are happening in your area so that you'll know what potential air quality impacts are happening. But somebody else told me that they also use it to see if they can go and participate in the prescribed burns that are happening in their area. So I thought that was a really interesting um, use of the app that was maybe not anticipated. But the um, watch duty one has proven really great if you wanna know, you know some of that real time data about like a fire in progress in your area as well. Um, so you can set up different alerts on those. Um, and maybe it's useful, Dom, we can put the, um, the PSPS um, so, you yeah. know, even when you're not in evac, you might be experiencing like, oh, anticipate a wildfire activity is gonna shut off your power. Like, what do I need to know, right? Like, what are some of those more nuanced considerations for farmers? Like, I need to irrigate my crops maybe if they're gonna shut off my water you know, or my power for a couple of days, so. Awesome, thanks, Amber. Maybe else just kind of like, what it, when you leave this webinar, is there one thing that you could do in the next week? What do you feel inspired to do? And again, I can't see the chat if you can. Our last one that we held at EcoFarm, a lot of people were really excited to go make their communication plans, for instance, to just get that. It's a really good, another low hanging fruit um, or build go bags and teach their staff. There were some farmers markets folks there that were gonna teach their staff about go bags so that they could share that information um, with farmers that they work at with too. Another good example. Yeah, and it was asked in the chat, um, some folks might have gotten kicked off by internet and storms. So we will send out um, a list of all the different links and resources at the end of the webinar through um, the sketch, like, you know, registration process. So you'll get all those um, anyway. Yeah, no worries. Awesome. Great. All right, well, we'll move on. So another, the, the kind of last component of the wildfire uh, workbook of the comprehensive um, vulnerability assessment is really, as you said, it's, it's huge. So it's good to just kind of spend time each week just going through and kind of figuring out where you're vulnerable and, and looking at the most high priority versions of that. And then you can really think about, you know, are there short term things like making a communications plan? If you sat down, you could probably do that within an hour um, and then get it laminated and put it in your barn. And then you can just be like, check, I've done that. Um, but a really much more an, e an easier way for you to kind of your brain maybe to handle a lot of all that information is to make an action plan. And so we have a template in there and that is kind of after you've done your comprehensive vulnerability assessment is to go back and pick out, you know, for the next month, the next year, what parts of that are you going to be implementing? So what needs to be done? How are you going to do it? You know, if it's re reduced fuel load, you know, that's a really giant topic. So how are you going to do it? Are you going to hire folks? Do you need to get, um, look for NRCS funding to help you um, to get money to do that, to hire people? Um, do you need equipment to help you do that? What are the costs related to that? Can you offset them with aid? Um, that's another big thing of that course that we mentioned, the financial preparedness. There's so much aid. When we first got into this, um, as I said, there was just people were reacting as if wildfires had never happened in California and they would never happen again. But luckily, um, I mean, unluckily they've continued. Luckily, um, there's been a lot of uh, catch up that's happened. So there are a lot of amazing programs out there to help you that will actually fund you to do a lot of this work. Um, so finding out the cost, or maybe it's just making sure that in your budget, you have the money to, to hire someone to help you with fuel load management. Um, so starting to make that plan for yourself. And then by when, you know, actually giving yourself a timeline. If your off season really is winter, making sure that you kind of front load your winter with doing some of this work so that when, um, you know, wildfire season now is starting in May a lot for a lot of places or it doesn't even stop. Um, but, you know, the fall comes and when you start smelling smoke and the emergency warnings start going out, you kind of know that you have already taken those steps. Um, and that you're maybe it's just training your staff so that everyone knows kind of who to call, where to go, um, putting in a second access road. I know that was a big one that um, came out from farmers in our last workshop, making sure that you have two ways in and out of your land and, and um, using your off time just to really do that. Um, so your action plan can basically be just like a roadmap for you to follow. 
so that once you've done all the kind of overwhelming understanding your vulnerability, you just have to follow that roadmap. You know, it can be just something that you add in to your weekly schedule or your, something you do every month, um, setting, you know, quarterly potlucks with your, your neighbors, understanding if you have older folks in your neighborhood who might not be getting the fancy um, app warnings about wildfires so you know to knock on their door and make sure that they have support when a disaster strikes. Um, these are the things that you can put into an action plan that'll really help this start to just feel like part of your life so that when a disaster happens, it doesn't have to upend everything. Katie, real quick, would you be able to take a question? Sure. I was yeah. just going to say, Dom, if it's the one from Muriel, I was going to compose an answer in the chat, but I'll also verbally address it um, if you don't mind, because Absolutely. Even if you are an urban farmer, you are at risk for different types of impacts like the toxic uh, ash that comes from fires. Like a lot of fires that are, start as wildfires can become urban fires and the Tubbs fire in Sonoma County is a perfect example of that. So if you're an urban farmer, you can still definitely be impacted, but there are some options for recovery and protecting your soils. Um, we did a podcast and Katie already mentioned Cheetah from Turkey Tail Farms up in Chico that survived the Butte County um, fire, uh, Paradise fire. And so um, thinking through some of that, we're actually in the process right now of developing a resource regarding, you know, food safety concerns post wildfire. So especially if you're in an urban area, right, it's not just trees burning around you, it's a bunch of toxic stuff burning around you. So heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, like we have a bunch of information on this, um, but we're also trying to you know, make it in multiple formats. So I'll pop some stuff in the chat, but if you have questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Thanks, Amber. Um, great, so Dom, if you would just pop that form in. Um, we're sharing an evaluation just on this workshop because um, it helps us. We're extremely collaborative and we are very feedback oriented. So we want to make sure that we are um, doing right by our audience. So if you could take a second to fill out this evaluation, this is kind of outside the small farm conference um, that helps us get funding. It helps us uh, make our materials better and support farmers and ranchers moving forward in this new normal. And then we just kind of went through this, what action um, towards wildfire resilience that you'll take next. Um, you can either share that in the chat, the chat or um, or raise your hand, put it in um, so that everyone kind of knows how to move forward. Or even for yourself, if you don't feel like sharing, you write it down um, today so you know what you're going to do next. So we'll go ahead and drop that in the chat, Dom. If you all could fill that out, um, either within the workshop or right after, that would be awesome. Um, and then for us, for what happens next, these are, we want to share all the different ways you can get more information. We can't cover everything. I know that probably feels like we just covered a lot. There's so much more to learn, but there's also so many more resources to support you. So I want to give CAF a second to share um, some of their ways to get involved and then I'll share farmer campuses. Go ahead, Amber. Thanks. Yes. So um, I really appreciate y'all just taking the time um, to address this content. It is dense. I've been doing this for a year and I keep learning like new terminology, et cetera. So um, just appreciating everyone, you know, paying attention, asking good questions. I know it can be a little tricky to get engaged or, um, you know, feel like you have the right thing to say during all of this. But um, every time I talk with somebody, I learn something new. So that is what improves our process. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you very much, um, as well as um, uh, the, there's other ways to get involved. I think I might have, might have mentioned, but I'll say it again, we have a statewide um, agri wildfire and ag um, stakeholder group so that anyone can be a part of that and help you know, produce or share resources. It's just basically a cross networking space. Um, and it's actually how I've um, recruited a bunch of different folks that are now a part of our program in deeper ways. And so, I just really appreciate um, everyone continuing those conversations, um, whether they're in that like less formal space, but also um, when uh, we have more funding opportunities, make sure you sign up for our newsletter so you're getting those announcements because otherwise it's hard to just let you know, you know, one at a time, um, uh, like, like you're on a wait list or something, get connected to us through that um, subscription option and I will put that in the chat. Otherwise, just call, call me, email me, whatever you prefer, um, we can figure it out.
Awesome. Thanks. And CAP has just done such a great job um, getting materials together. And we're so grateful to have Amber. And, and again, Amber's job is to be talking to you about wildfire. So take her up on that if you have questions and get involved. And we're all part of this um, stakeholder group. And it's a great place to learn about all sorts of opportunities that are happening. And then if you have different, I've, I've heard from a couple of you that you are working with in this field. So um, it's a place for you to share opportunities to get involved with your own work too. And then with Farmer Campus, um, we, as I said, we have our free online course, The Farmers Build Wildfire Resilience. That will take you through from the cultural context and ecological context of wildfire, all the way through preparation, response, recovery. It's extremely robust. Um, we have a fast track for that if you don't want to do the whole thing. But if you do want the whole thing, you will end up so much more resilient than you were before. It's also a place in which we've collected, um, I think we have 10 to 15 case studies in there that are podcasts so you can just pop it in and go out and harvest and listen and they're really interesting uh, the ways different farmers have been impacted and then the ways in which they are thinking about it and recovering um, and then we've got just really great videos from all sorts we have um, the Kirk tribe sharing a cultural burning and native burning practices and how um, you know kind of our original farmers thought about wildfire and then ways in which the state has started paying attention to that and adapting um, to managing how to manage a forest if it's on your farm and how to actually think about your farm as integrated into a forest system. It's an awesome course, um, teaches you, we have farmers who teach you how to make a go bag based on actual farmers, not just, you know, the one that you would look up online. It's a nuance to think through your dog and your livestock and um, the different files you might have for as a farmer. We have activities um, things like how to take inventory to make sure that if you do have to file a, a claim for insurance that you know how to do that and that you've um, prepared for that. What I don't have on here is our um, the mini course I just mentioned, the financial preparedness one that Dom shared. That's another one. So if you once you join Farmer Campus, you'll be able to see those courses and um, all you have to do is enroll and join and those are free. And those we, um, we make free and available to farmers and ranchers because we know that it can kind of make or break your livelihood. Um, and you're welcome to kind of their self paced you can either go through the whole thing or you can cherry pick and just go in and look for the resources that are necessary for you. Um, and then definitely download the workbook again like I said we'll have the, the um, full version done by the end of this year. Um, if you want to share that with share that link with whoever you want it's a free downloadable workbook. Um, so definitely use that. We do workshops like this pretty frequently, um, but we cover a lot of topics. Like we we had one in January on crop insurance. We went through the micro farm policy and the whole farm protection, revenue protection, the so things that you might not really want to think about, but that are really important. We bring in really great experts to to talk about that, um, and we also work a lot in climate resilience as well. And then my um, counterpoint, Natalia Pinson, is doing um, an incredible research project right now on farmers and ranchers who are adapting to wildfire. So you can participate in that and that will help shape um, the, her research, which will also hopefully inform policy moving forward as well as all of our educational materials. So that's a great place to really get your voice out. And then check us out. We've got all sorts of other materials um, and we're really here to serve you. So um, get involved, we're here to take care of you. We just wanna thank all of our funders that make this possible as well as our partners like CAF um, Nuestra Comunidad, SER, RMA, um, we have some incredible partners out there making this work possible. And just so that you all know, there really are a lot of people thinking about this and care about you and want to make um, this future a little less scary. Um, I think we have a little bit of time if people have questions and we'd love to answer them or if you want to just share anything, reflections, we have time for that too. While folks are gathering the courage, I just wanted to plug that um, farmers tell us what's happening out there. And so, for example, one of our wildfire emergency applicants brought to our attention something that hadn't even been on our radar at all, which is the impacts of wildfire retardant on um, cropping systems. So now we're looking into that and partnering with CCOF and the National Organic Standards Program to determine what can be done to support farmers that have been impacted in those ways. So. Definitely, this content gets um, refined and and uh, you know advised by your direct experiences. So please, please, please reach out and tell us what you're dealing with, and we will do our best to um, build something that's relevant and accessible. Any questions? Otherwise, we can wrap up.
Awesome. Well, feel free to unmute yourself and say thank you, Amber and Dom, if you want to say a parting word, feel free. I just want to thank you all. I know it's a lot to put through a webinar. And um, again, I just want to encourage you to think of yourselves as key parts to resilience statewide. We need you. The world needs you. Um, there's resources to support you. And this is really a community effort and this is collaborative and let's um, let's support each other moving forward and really think through the most innovative ways um, as the symptoms of climate change are come upon us. Um, and thanks for spending your time with us today. And if you feel like it, come on video and say, let's see your faces. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amber and Katie. I feel like we learned a lot, um, not only from the presentation, but also from the chat and seeing folks that, you know, work with zoos and help with wildfires. And so, yeah, it was great being part of this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. Couldn't do it without Dom. We, we need somebody to help us organize ourselves. And also, Bea, thank you for being our fearless host in the background. Our bad for not communicating our um, <laughs> tech needs in advance so we're all learning thanks everybody thank you all so much thank you for your time and thank you for the participants for being here we'll hope to see most of you as well in the next sessions or in the next few days and don't forget we have the uh, regional gatherings and uh yeah we would love to see y'all uh those places as well and see you in person and don't forget to do the eval. That really helps us um, understand what we can change or adjust or add um, so that this is more and more useful and applicable to y'all. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. All right. Cheers, all. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.